Growing up, we were all taught in school to memorize this map and the hemispheres that went along with it. We were, of course, shown the north, south, east, and west hemispheres. But why? There is no reason to split up the earth like some Cartesian plane except to make use of longitudinal and latitudinal coordinates. This arbitrary divide doesn't actually provide any insight about the earth's natural surface structure. Instead, it teaches us a mathematical system, not the actual geographical layout of the earth. 19th century geographer Carl Ritter makes this clear in his book, Comparative Geography. Quote, Whether we divide the globe into northern and southern, or eastern and western hemispheres, their relative amounts of land and water will be different. The northern hemisphere contains, approximately, 38,500,000 square miles of land and 59,600,000 thousand square miles of water. The southern contains about 12,800,000 square miles of land and 85,500,000 square miles of water. The eastern hemisphere contains 36,700,000 square miles of land and 61,400,000 square miles of water. And the western about 14,600,000 square miles of land and 83,500,000 square miles of water. So we can see that in terms of quantity alone, the relationship between east and west and north and south is altogether imbalanced. But even in qualitative comparisons, such as the symmetry of shape, we find that these hemispheric divisions produce entirely irregular parts. Carl Ritter again states, quote, Besides the division quantitatively, the division in respect to symmetry of shape is entirely irregular. Symmetry, as we usually use the word, consists in the arrangement of parts at equal distances, or two sides at least, from some central point or line. Mineral crystals are regarded in relation to the point where crystallization began. Plants are viewed in relation to the stem axis, animals in relation to the symmetry of the entire structure. A similar law of symmetry is entirely wanting to the globe. Its arrangement is altogether unlike this. It is not nearly so perceptible at first glance, yet it is far more profound in design and comprehensive in its relations. So, if we see that persistent objects in nature, such as crystals or living things, usually have some comprehensive structure of symmetry, some profound balance in form, what then is the Earth's comprehensive structure? How is the Earth balanced? To show you that the Earth does, in fact, have a balanced structure, and how Mother Nature draws her hemispheric lines, let us return to some numbers. From Carl Ritter again, quote, the continents and islands lie mainly in the northern hemisphere. It's about 38 million square miles. Scarcely a third of their superficies, which is about 12 million square miles, are in the southern hemisphere. The continents are so situated also that the eastern contains by far the largest body of land. It's 36 million square miles. The western being only about one-third as large, which is about 13 million square miles. America, the western, it will be seen, has no first-class island lying near it. It stands isolated. All this goes to show that the greatest landmass lies in the northern hemisphere, dividing the earth in one way, and in the eastern, dividing it in another. Quote, in the northeast, the watery realm is the most contracted, in the southwest, the least. We are thus enabled to speak of the land side of the globe, the land hemisphere, and a water side, the water hemisphere. This 
is the most significant natural division and balance that brings symmetry to the Earth's form, on one side, land, and on the other side, water. So, as we speak of north and south poles, we can also meaningfully speak of land and water poles. The water pole would be somewhere around New Zealand, whereas the land pole would be somewhere between France and Great Britain. Thus, as Carl Ritter states, quote, The dwellers around the North Sea are the antipodes of the New Zealanders. They are not only in direct opposite positions on Earth, they are in directly opposite environments, in terms of both climate and geography. That this would lead to vastly different cultures and societies seems inevitable. Europe is essentially at the center of the temperate continental world. Compared to the unfathomable expanse of water that is the Pacific, the land hemisphere is so solidly compacted that even the Arctic Ocean becomes merely a broad channel. Hell, even the Atlantic begins to look like a large inland sea compared to the Pacific. On the other hand, in the oceanic realm, islands are scattered like distant stars from one another. They are insignificant with respect to area compared to the wide waste of waters surrounding them. It is hard to imagine that this distinct contrast of environments would not have a great effect upon the life and character of man. Humans significantly depend upon the conditions amid which they develop. Quote, the inhabitants of one of the Pacific islands dwelt in a world whose utmost possibilities to him lay in the adjacent islands within view, and which his canoe could reach in a few hours' sail. The difference in culture between him and those whose range of observation has been greater must have been immense. So, by dividing the earth along the natural grain of the wood, so to speak, we can see this balance of earth and water realms, and we can begin to grasp the comprehensive structure of our planet, as well as how it relates to us human beings. In future videos, I will continue to work through Carl Ritter's book Comparative Geography and get into greater detail about how geography relates to the development of man. Thank you for watching.